welcome to the Beetle and Grimm's Home Shopping Network. Today, Shipping Goblin George here is going to let you know about the amazing selection of officially licensed Dungeons & Dragons jewelry that we've made available. Yes, water deep, shiny faction tokens, shiny dragon coins, mm. oh, shiny, shiny shark medallion. <laughs> They're absolutely beautiful, aren't they? Oh, and here's an update. As a special offer for today only, if we don't sell 10 pieces by the end of this commercial, George and I will both be killed. Seriously? Not to worry. 10 very reasonably priced pieces of D&D jewelry is not a problem. I, I'm sure no one wants us to die. <laughs> How much money you got on you? Oh, uh, uh, bones, lint, more bones. Come on, 15 bucks for three dragon pieces. It, it, we get the ball rolling. Oh, okay, okay. Ooh, more bones. Fifteen dollars. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was saving that for lunch. Oh, sale number one, baby. Here we go. <laughs> Dam's broken. Let's go. Run! Okay, and hello. Hopefully we have sound. Um, we'll, we'll just carry on with this as, we, as we normally do. Hello, welcome <laughs> to Band of Badgers. I'm Dave, your host. Uh, and I would say that Steve is joining us, uh, but he's not here yet. He's going to be about half hour. So what we're going to do is split this into two halves. The first half, we're going to talk to both our, uh, both our guests, Bill and Justice, about everything to do with Beeling Grimm. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good, how are you? No, it's about it was well timed. It was yeah. almost <laughs> <a day. laughs> good. I'm not going to give you any chance of yeah. It's it's fine. Um, I'm good. Um, we've just had a bit of a heat wave here in the UK. Uh, we've got 40 mile an hour wind. So if you hear any noises, it's not me. Um, it it is the wind outside. But yeah, I spent the okay. day down at the coast today. It's it's been great. Get some fresh air. Wow. Um, okay. But Steve will be joining us uh, later on. Uh, if you have any questions in live chat, do put it into into there if you can. Uh, put it as a question. And if any of us see it, if Bill sees it, if Justice sees it, we'll just shout them out. We inter we'll interrupt what we're doing just so you can have your answers. Now, um, as I mentioned, we're going to split this into, into two halves. The first half, we're going to talk about all things Beetle and Grimm. The second half, we're going to take a look at uh, a closer look at the silver edition of the Ravensloft box. Uh, the shadowy silver edition, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we're going to unbox it, and Justice is going to come and talk us through all the bits and pieces as we do. And then, uh, a reason to keep your questions coming is we had uh, the guys at Beard and Grimm have been very generous and given us a $50 gift voucher off of all their merchandise. So, ask a question, and if Bill and Justice think it's the best question, you will win. It is that easy. We don't roll dice. We're not going to spin the dial. Just ask a really good question. It's that, it's that simple. Right, so. Excellent. Guys, how have you been? The, the last time I've uh, seen you, in terms of uh, seeing you on on Twitch and on streams, was yeah. at D&D &D Live. So how was that? I mean, you've you got to go be back around the table for a start. Yeah, I mean, just just uh, at that level, it was amazing. I mean, that's um, really, I think the we we got together once in person as a group just to play D and D. But like, that's my second time at a gaming table in a year and a half, I think. Yeah, with like live people, so it was it was pretty exciting. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and G four did a great job. Um, the whole thing was so well run. Uh, well organized. Um, they, they did it. They did a nice, nice job. Was, was it more strange because it was because um, this one was in a studio. This this was right. straight to camera, all in a studio. Not like the previous yeah. years where you've seen these big events and people are walking around and 
Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's it's heartbreaking to lose that live event. Yeah. Uh, anybody who has been to D and D live for the last few years, um, it's such an inspiring, uh, heartwarming experience to just like everybody's so great, and you get to see a lot of these people that you have worked with or talked with online and, and everybody's very supportive and collaborative and in a great mood. And, um, it's just, it's, it's a really, really fun experience. So we didn't have that, which was, mm -hmm. which was too bad. Um, but in terms of the show itself for the viewing audience, I thought they put, they put together a really great show. Fantastic. I mean, the, the stuff that you got to, so, the last time you was on the stream, it was when you was doing um, Frost Maiden, when you did your charity one with Deborah Ann Wall, and that was over camera. This time you got to, is this the first time you got to meet Deborah Ann Wall in person? No, I've met her before, but it was the first time I've gamed with her in person. And what about? I, I know Matt has several times, but um, yeah. And what about so that was, what about Seth Green? Because that's <laughs> that was the first time I've met Seth. Yeah, he and he and Matt are old friends, but uh, it's the first time I've met him. I have to say, literally the nicest human I've ever met in my life. Like, I always say, you can you can judge somebody's character by how they treat the parking attendant. Like everybody <laughs> can be nice to people who are in charge yeah. or people who they view as their equals. You know, like movie stars are really nice to other movie stars but seth green is one of those people who like knew the makeup assistant's name and went up and thanked her on the way out okay. like that is a really really class act he was so kind and generous to everybody just love the guy so we, we've whereas b dave is a total bastard <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a joke that's Joe. Oh, super nice guy. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure? Uh, so, I mean, yeah. I, I've been talking to, to B Dave as well on uh, on Twitter because uh, we I, I was way back before Christmas. I wanted him to be the bad guy on our Rune Lords. Oh which yeah, our, our Rune Lords campaign is now wrapped up. It took ten months. Um, an incredible story. Congratulations, That's by the way. Yeah. yeah, that was for our first um, for our first online campaign. Um, yeah, that that took a lot of. Uh, a lot, I took two days off, which was Christmas and my birthday. <laughs> and then we had guests booked in every week for, for like six months in advance. Um, although we're still trying to get justice on because the last time we spoke with justice, <laughs> it was snowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, that was for yeah, our, uh, for yeah, our great British Russia. No, right no, I bet you could too with the heat wave. Yes, it's, it's crazy here. It's unbelievable. So what? What's? Um, I wanted to talk about what is next with Beetle and Grimm, because we've we've we're starting to see a few things. We obviously have the new Witchlight Platinum box. So this is this is the next Platinum line. Yep. Um, and there's also something with Darrington Press that you've kind of slowly been eking out on the website, and with the new uh, Taldori Reborn. Yeah. It's exciting stuff. There's new stuff coming. Is that? Is that we're going to see that this year, or is that for twenty twenty two? So we will we will be able to announce uh, exactly what we're doing very soon, uh, and we, you know, in our normal sort of model, we will start taking pre orders. Uh, my understanding is that it will actually ship in the beginning of twenty twenty two, but don't quote me on that. Uh, yeah. that that's that that timeline's been moving around a little bit but that's that's my understanding because you've also been hit by you know finding um suppliers from all around the world and bits and pieces as well so how is that yeah it's been i, I mean i think I, I think everybody's having the same experience and i i think everybody knows now that um just every every aspect of production in almost every part of the world has been impacted by COVID and yeah. in, in very um, sort of unpredictable ways, you know, uh, things, places get shut down and, you know, there's just, it's, it's very, very difficult. And um, uh, yeah. And, and, and shipping is even worse. Um, you know, we'll get things done and then, 
have no way to get it here. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're just, we're having all the same challenges that everybody else is, and we're just going to, you know, do our best to keep, try to keep ahead of schedule so that we, we can build in some time for whatever these unpredictable um, uh, events impact us. So we, we've seen a few bits and pieces. I, I like the way you kind of dodged the question there. We'll bring it back to Darrington Press. <laughs> I'm, I'm awfully good at dodging. <laughs> I'm dodging. So, so I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, what Are we going to see like platinum boxes and silver boxes or things for Darrington Press? Or are these are, are these kind of boxes strictly for D&D? &D? Are you, is is the platinum box a, a B and G <laughs> product? That's a really a good &E question. <laughs> well, well played, Justice. Yeah, um, uh... I will say, I will say that these kinds of boxes are not just for D and D. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're definitely looking for an opportunity to do one with Paizo, um, and uh, it's entirely possible that we might do something like that for other companies as well. How's that? <laughs> that is good. That's a good answer. That, that's the nice. good news okay. is the good news is if you look at the official announcement for um, Taldori Reborn, the GM screen, we're gonna have player handouts. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those familiar elements that you've seen from us before, you will see again. Now, what format they take, that has been yet to be revealed and will be in due time. <laughs> See, there's, there's some of the things I, again, bring it back to the stuff that is unique to Beetle and Grimm is your encounter cards, the, the top quality handouts, the printed maps, um, everything is top notch. And every single box, you have these unique items. Now, I've, I, you know, I've got this in front of me, which we're going to have a look at very, very soon. Um, but every single box, you do something new and unique. You push those boundaries. I'm just, I'm always curious to jump ahead and see what is what you're going to bring with next you know because they are just the, the stuff you create is stunning and we've got uh for those of you watching on twitch um, and if you're watching this on youtube um you'll see the background artwork appear and these are from uh atmosphere images uh, some of these are unique as well to Beale and grim and especially in the ravenloft box because i've been uh following your work over the past few years this is the first time you have your own collection of original stories so uh before yeah. you disappear but what i wanted to ask i mean you've got dread towers in here and we used to kind of get the one sheet encounter and your unique um pre-gen characters then it was a a fold out we got two sides of a kind of a story with a bit more now we have a what a, a 30 to 40 page booklet written by you guys are we going to see more beetle and grim unique content out there because i would love to see it yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, I got to give Justice a lot of credit on this. I think um, having him join us full time last year kind of gave us the courage to take another step forward in mm -hmm. content creation. And um, when you, you know, when you get to the unboxing part, he'll, he'll be able to talk on it a lot more. But um, because he has so much experience in writing uh, for role playing games, um, we've all kind of lined up behind him and, and, and let him kind of lead us into this, this new, uh, new area. Um, and, and so uh, Ravenloft was just the perfect book to do it because mm -hmm. it's more of a, a source material book. There isn't a lot of existing adventure content in it. There's, no. there's one really fantastic adventure in Ravenloft uh, in, in the main book. Um, that they wrote, but it's short. So it, it was a good opportunity for us to create some more stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, absolutely. We, um, we're, we're definitely expanding how much we do. I think we're going to keep taking baby steps, uh, forward with that. And when we do other source material books like this, I think we will, um, you know, now that we've done it once and we feel like it was successful, we'll be a lot braver about about taking those kind of steps and, and making, um, 
you know, bigger, bigger pieces of original material. And, and, you know, we still are, we're still working on, uh, on our own sort of larger mm -hmm. independent freestanding open source material, but it's, it's hard to fit it in with all the other stuff we're doing. It just, it always kind of finds its way into, uh, into the back burner because we just have so many, um, so many Project. deadlines to hit. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of nice, uh, you know, as Bill had mentioned, the, them doing a setting really, really opens up that availability for us to to put something like like uh, these dread tales that we'll talk about later uh, together. And it's really cool. You know, a lot of the time when we're working with an adventure or something that's, you know, already structured out that sometimes it's hard to think, you know, how do we add content and in here that is useful for uh, your your GM and um that they'll want to incorporate in their games um so when we get the opportunity to tie like four different adventures together it's mm -hmm. it's really special so and it's fun because um we all were four different authors from our company worked in it and uh getting to brainstorm and and tie those together was a lot of fun it was and nice i can see some of the Sorry, uh, you go. I was going to say, it, it was nice to see uh, how you tie those, like using the four artifacts, tie them together, just kind of drop your players into something different, unique, different environment each time. Um, not not to kind of pick sides, but I, I, the favorite one uh, was the, the, the granary because it was a zombie horde kind of thing. I did yeah. enjoy that one. Um, I think that was John, Bills. I saw, that's why right, that's right, I'm like... Uh, um, but is that, I think it was John. John's one I found a bit strange. It was turtleneck wearing werewolves. It, it was the stuntman troll. Oh, wow. You know, I love that stuntman troll. Like when I love roll tables that are just kind of absurd. Yep. And there is a roll table in there for like which stunt moves he does and what he calls them. And I think that is just like the most fun, random thing. Um, some of your some of your art is going through the Twitch. I, I see we, we yep. did commission some pieces for these um, from Claudio Pozos and Shen Fei um, that you'll see pop up. Claudio's done a lot of work for wizards and magic items and scenes and stuff. Um, but he did he did two of the encounters artwork uh, and some of the uh, the creatures that you'll see, like there's a singing bugbear in one and, a, and in Bill's. Yeah, uh, the singing there is bugbear. a the frightening bugbear. little vampire spawn. <laughs> yes. That was also She's very nice darling. as well. Yeah, the, yeah she is a darling. <laughs> but ju just as your story was the Egyptian one. Now, I... Yeah, the Harakir's story. Yeah, that was interesting. I remember playing a computer game. I don't know if it was on... I don't know if it was on PC or Amiga, if we go way back, but there was a Ravensloft computer game that came out which was all egyptian and i wonder yeah, and i'm sure the the main pharaoh mummy thing um was An anchor top that's so yeah that's the same one as it is in, in in the book in your story yeah and i wondered if it, if it was the same as soon as i read the name i was like oh it just threw me way back yeah it sounds like it is i know that uh there was an older uh, i th i think it was a book by the same name was van richten's guide to ravenloft back in i want to say second edition uh, I have, it's called domains of dread I have it here oh okay domains of dread okay uh there there is a van richten's guide to ravenloft is there not i feel like there yeah. there is another book um but yeah the domains of dread book yeah, yeah. mark here is detailed in there i believe it's it's known as an isle of dread back then it wasn't its own unique uh domain per se it was kind of like a smaller realm I looked at this forever um but there, that's cool that you have that uh you know alex Kammer, uh he he runs uh game hulk on he has that oh. huge collection He'll do a, a post a day where he goes through the collection each year, talks about a piece, and then seeing him pull out these obscure supplements from like the early '90s, late '80s, it's just it's really cool to see. Um, but but yeah yeah that was an interesting one to write for, especially because of how many changes it, it went through mm -hmm. since the the um, last time it showed up. I don't think it showed up in any editions really heavily since. It, it, it's stunning. You mentioned the, the artwork on there. You've got unique artwork uh, curated as well for your stories in here. 
Plus, yeah. you've reused uh, the maps, and I wanted to pick up on the maps. I know we're going to talk about this later anyway, but the map artwork on these on these sets in this box it seems to have gone up a level as well. There's so much mm. detail packed in each square. Is mm. is that we're going to see more of this going forward? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're we we've got a small group of of uh cartographers that mm. we just adore um that we think do wonderful work and i think maybe um uh i i i mean i i think they've been doing fantastic work throughout but maybe they're they're kind of upping each other's game because they, yeah. they start to see you know like um the the kind of stuff that that the other uh artists are doing but um i i i I mean, I can't say enough about those those artists. They they do wonderful work. They do it incredibly fast and um, uh, are really collaborative. Uh, you know, we had to change some things with. I know the map that I worked on for my adventure. We had to change a few times, and and um, it was a great collaborative process, and and it's just super fun to do. Yeah, this is the first time that we've had maps that are tied to our bonus encounters that we printed out. I think it's Bill's and mine are the only ones that we have full maps for. Um, there are some in the booklet, but we wanted to provide those maps that felt like they were useful even outside of the bonus encounter. So yeah. Bill's is this big mill site, uh, which you could use even if you never ran any of our adventures. If you, your characters ever go to a, a mill, like hey, you have that map, same for me with the was. If you go into an, you know, an old pyramid somewhere, like mm -hmm. you have an entrance, you have a familiar structure, it's all square, it's, it looks, you know, it's in a desert. So uh, for me, it's important to have those kind of reusable elements um, because I know a lot of people that they find, you, you know, you find this obscure map that Wizards had in a map pack 10 years ago, and that's still hitting the table regularly. And your players are good sports. They're yeah. like, oh, we've never seen this field before. Um, but yeah. uh, but it'd be cool if our maps are that for somebody else one day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they, they yeah and you can't so run nice. a big a big zombie horde adventure without uh, without a battle map and, and some <laughs> yeah, for sure. move around. Like, it's... it's uh, that's that it, it screamed out for it so speak uh speaking of artwork we've actually got sean tw um who's one of our cartoonists who works with works with the badgers and then bill mm -hmm. um you were doing um i think it's for the raven lost books you were doing every every person from the team was doing a quick kind of thing on uh, instagram video or just a quick oh, video yeah. on your mobile yeah and, yeah, yeah. My my dog unboxing. Yeah. Yes, the dog unboxing. And you were sat in front of the bookcase, which is behind you. And then behind yeah. you, I also spotted is Sean's yeah. artwork that he did for yeah, you. It's right there. You can see it. It's, yeah. it's tiny, but uh, yeah. yeah. I love that piece. <laughs> that, that piece makes me so happy. That was really nice. Nice. I saw it on the uh, when, you, when you posted it. I was like, oh, Sean, look. Can you see what I see? Look, look what's on yeah. the bookcase. He was, he was <laughs> over the moon. Um, I so bet glad. he's disappeared now, but... <laughs> He was over the moon by it. Good, good, good. That was really generous of him to do that. So uh, we really appreciated it. Cool. Um, so what's, we've mentioned, oh, uh, was it uh, yes, Maverick 2? That yes. Was, yes, that was my dog. His name is Tackle. Um, and uh, and he and my, my wife dressed him up as a purple worm. If you haven't seen that <laughs> video, you really should. It's pretty magical. <laughs> you know, I used to think that maybe, Bill, you maybe you were a bard or a paladin or something, but I think after seeing your pet bears uh, a couple times that you probably are a druid or a ranger. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> we've seen, we've seen, uh, just mentioned in chat there by Maverick, um, the purple worm, coming back to purple worm. So let's see if we, how, many, how many minutes we can squeeze in now, because I know Bill has to run off. So the Purple yeah, yeah. Worm, you did D&D uh, &D Live. Are we going to yeah. see, is that like a continual thing we're going to see with that now? Are you going to do a different creature every time? What, yeah. What's John's so that's, plan? That's definitely the plan. That, that was definitely uh, our plan to sort of uh, use that as a way to launch um, this concept for, for people who didn't see it. It's basically, uh, it's an hour long show and uh, it's called Faster Purple Worm Kill Kill. And um, the... Uh, the concept basically is a group of 
first level characters go up against one of the uh, classic big bads of um, of role playing game lore. So it might be a purple worm, it might be an ancient red dragon, it might be one of the you know the the big demons or whatever. But basically, something where the players have absolutely zero chance of surviving. Um, so it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's a suicide squad with no happy ending. Um, but it's uh, it's super fun. It's very quick. It's very sort of punk rock ridiculous. And um, it's it, you know we feel like it's a great format for a show because it's it's an hour long and we can have a different cast every time we're restarting yep. every time you can jump in anytime you want you're not going to have to worry about what happened in the last episode um and um you know because it's a because it's it's a different cast every time and it's a it's a short show um it's really more uh it, it's it's a lot easier to get people to come in and guest because it's a small commitment you don't really have to prep for it. You don't have to know the story. It's easy for guest DMs to come in because um, you know it's 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 a it's a pretty short tale to write. Um, yep. And um, so it, I think it's, it's a TPK play on purpose. I, I love the idea. It's yeah. literally come oh, yeah. in and I'm going to kill you. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's just scripted TPK for sure. Um, so yeah. So you know it's 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 just a lot of fun. It's it feels more like sort of. Um, like that whose line is it anyway kind of show than than a, a role playing game show per se because it's it's mostly just the the interaction of the players and talking about their 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 characters and their characters hopes and dreams which will inevitably be crushed by the end of the show because you didn't really get to play because you were the host so yeah. you were doing all the announcement stuff so here's a here's a quick question we have something similar so we have what we call, uh, we're doing some, something with uh, Epic, Epic Encounters, but we're doing okay. the Expander Badges. Basically, the Expendables, we're the Expender Badges. Okay. Um, create your movie action hero character, come in, there's no background story, you have a primary weapon, secondary weapon, and then survive. And that's all you gotta do, it's a three hour run. So if you ever wanna come on and play an action hero star, um, get in touch, that's, we'll, that's we'll put you <laughs> Yeah, super fun. And then what, last thing before you go, Dragon's Fire asked a question earlier. Do either of you have a favorite artifact or thing included from any of your boxes? What is the most favorite? Oh, that's a good, really good question. Um... Yeah, I really like the Infernal Contract in Avernus. Yeah. Somebody who's written a lot about Infernal Contracts. The metal yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, has, yeah, has used yeah. them a lot in our games. I really like that one. But I surprisingly, I would probably say the Hellrider badge is is way up there. Just because after, you know, we're finishing up our Avernus campaign and mm -hmm. we have three Hellriders in the group, <laughs> and that oh, symbol has great. become really important for them. Yeah, they they love it, and oh, uh, so their characters have revolved around it, and it's it's become super important. So, and I love the way that badge looks. It's super epic. I, lo I, I love hearing about like when 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 people have have used things in our boxes not just not just strictly in the way that they were mm -hmm. you know that they're scripted in the book but that it's it's inspired them to go off and do something you know at expand on something completely different within that story um i think uh, you know my my sort of general answer is always the um the coins i i love seen currency from other worlds like it's mm -hmm. sort of a, just sort of an archaeology kind of uh excitement for me that that like it, it just seeing a set of coins from a different uh world just it it, it sort of sparks my imagination about everything mm -hmm. about what that city or world or country or civilization or whatever uh would be up to and i, I think they can be um really uh imaginative and unique and tell you a lot about about a civilization just by the kinds of coins they use and what they put on them and um so those are always a lot of fun to work on mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. My, I, my I, honorable I, mention would be the holy symbol of Ravenkind, which is back in our store now. Uh, but <laughs> when they put it on the back of the variant cover for Van Richten, so I was like, we oh, did yeah. a really good job on that piece. It's like easily recognizable. It looks exactly like it. Uh, and it's just cool to see something always pop out from a page and, and be a physical artifact, um, especially a magic item. That's, that's one of the things that I think I liked. Uh, for example, the Waterdeep box. You had the Abolith, uh, magnetic Abolith artifact on yeah, the, yeah. Of the box. Yeah, uh, yeah. Quilloran. Yeah, that. I mean, yeah. that was a great touch just to kind of put that mm -hmm. on there. I, again, I that yeah. as I think for most people who have who have fallen in love with Beetle and Grimm's, as, as everything you do, we missed out on the Waterdeep, and I think it, it's it's gutting <laughs> we missed out on the Waterdeep, but yeah i've got everything yeah I get, a, yeah I get a lot of questions about water deep and uh, i run our support queue yeah. uh and i yeah i get a lot of requests about please reprint that i'm you know i'm sorry we can't do another platinum of that but could you do a silver uh, could you do a bronze yeah we, we've talked about we've talked about going back and doing a silver edition of water deep i think we will probably do that at some point uh again it's just um uh it's just bandwidth, you know. We just yeah. got a lot of stuff going on this year, so uh, listen. I'm going to have to run. I really apologize. No uh, worries. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, you're in good hands with justice. Yep. And uh, have fun. Thank you, everybody, for coming by. Really fun to be on this show, and I'm. I think I'm going to be on next month, right? Yep. To, uh, we're we're going to get you back to talk about the to talk about, Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> nice. They, and it's bigger I, than what I thought it was as well. I, I know you sent it, me the photos. It's a beast. But, I yeah. have to say, it, it's bigger than we thought too. It's uh, but but we have the uh, we have the official version now, and it's Gorgeous. it's big and it's beautiful, and I can't wait to show it off. So we'll <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll do that next month. Fantastic. Again, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, everybody, stay tuned. We are going to be doing an unboxing of the Ravenloft. Justice is going to stick around for a little bit longer until he's had his Ooh. his Weetabix. Um, I'm just going to switch over cameras. Steve, if you're listening, are you out there? You can join us now. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see if he's there. And we're going we're gonna, to, I've got a camera up here set up. Um, yeah, and... I was looking at that. You know, I've been thinking about doing something like that here. And uh, I noticed it's a phone. Is that right? Yeah, I've just, I've just stuck my mobile on there. That's fine. That's awesome. It works. I can zoom. I can do whatever I need to do um it's it's really really handy um it's just a matter of switching around some of the some of the cameras because uh, we use this for painting as well so yeah um, yeah we've also got uh i can't yeah we still haven't gotten now. to do our paint day either i know and it there was a, you had a freak snowstorm delay last time <laughs> well our great british brush off season three actually starts next monday and we've got uh, we've got a few things going on. You, if you're free, you're welcome to join us. We're just going to be painting anything next Sunday. You know, I'm about to I'm about to go. My both my parents are retired retired this year um, at the same time, and I'm next week. I'm gonna have a little vacation, and I'm actually gonna go to uh, Florida and hang out with them and celebrate their retirement. I'm not yeah. one for the beach, but there will be lots of delicious cooking. Cool. Well, we've got, uh, Steve is trying to join us, I think. Um, what I'm going to do is just quickly uh, set up, um, switch around. Well, I can do that now. That's fine. Right, let's turn that off and switch to this one. There we go. So, everyone in chat, if you have any specific questions, I'm literally just going to open the box and have a look. So, if you have any questions do, about anything that's inside, do let us know. Uh, yeah, so, so, yes. Steve is in the wrong seat. We'll, we'll switch that around in a second. <laughs> right. Yeah, da, 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 da. This is what happens with uh, live. I call it live TV. It, but it, you know, it works. We put one over there, and we put one over there. There we go. See, we are saved. All makes sense. There we go. <laughs> so, I'm going to take the lid off. It is, as always, one of the, one of the best things um, is that they're always nice and strong boxes, so it won't hurt if I throw it around. Yeah, and, and I'll say too, right off the bat, before even I open the box, we already have some cool stuff in that there are four different boxes for this yes. edition. We, um, we had them rotating four. on the other screen, but yeah. What yeah, was the yeah, reason there are for multiple, 
marks of horrors in the book um, based on different genres mm -hmm. with gothic horror, folk horror, which is the box that um, you have. Uh, then there's also a cosmic horror with lots of uh, delicious tentacles um, that I actually have next to me. Um, and then there is a... Um, there's one more that I'm forgetting. Body horror, which looks like an aboleth. Uh, or not an aboleth, a uh, beholder or something because of all the eyeballs. Nice. I'm just going to bring in the, the promo box. We, we'll keep that ticking over until Steve joins. There we go. Right. So let's dig in. We have something. A little bit, we've got it on kind of, uh, we would call it tracing paper here in the UK. You've ha you have a black feather, which is part of the Raven's Queen gifts. Is yeah, right? yeah. So um, Matt's daughter Addie actually designed that that feather, and uh, he thought it would be a cool introduction to the to the box. It kind of like sits atop everything. Mm -hmm. You kind of have a tease of what's underneath, but it kind of sets the tone as you're going in. Um, and then the next thing you see is that that plan chat. Yeah, that's lovely. And then this is the the typical kind of what what's included. We have the letter from the team, which is always great to see. Um, yeah. Um, so some cool new things about this letter to purchaser. Uh, we actually included all of the encounter cards listed that are in there. That's the yep. first time we've done that. Very um, handy. And you'll see uh, that there's a mention in the adventure in our bonus encounters. We've done something kind of experimenting in this one, where anytime you see a monster for which you have stats, um, you have an encounter card, it's actually going to be red. Um, and that includes the text of the book. Very nice. I, 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 it was always nice to see these, uh, see these bits and pieces as well, especially the letter, because it's it's such a nice set for the time, the time that we're in. It was cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt, Matt mo wrote most of that letter, and then I edited it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's very heartfelt, and uh, I, I did not think. I mean, none of us thought we would be in this as long as we would be yes. uh, with the pandemic and all the different things so uh but matt always writes very uh good letters and uh, that's that's a special one for sure now one of the other things on here as well we, we, we was talking about it earlier this is the dread tales so mm -hmm. this is completely original it's written by the team um so we've got bill charlie john and yourself and then mm -hmm. you've wrapped them up together in this kind of into the mists dread tales and um, yeah chris daly point, did that art of our um uh raven pendant that you'll see in the box yeah um but yeah there are four bonus encounters um well they're not you know these aren't even encounters these are adventures short adventures four bonus adventures and uh a framework that you can use to tie them all together yeah um so you can either use these all separate if you're if you know you're going to be in one of these four different ravenloft domains um, you can, you have an adventure ready to go. Um, now the cool thing about these as well, we usually like to tie into the content somehow. Um, the adventure in the book, I believe takes you to the end of third level. Um, so these encounters start at fourth to, mm -hmm. uh, take you all the way to level eight. If yeah. you go through each of them. Um, so they're and they're very different there's a sort of defend the area type one that bill wrote there's a there's a cosmic horror um lots of body horror going on in that one that charlie wrote where uh, that takes place on blutespur which is kind of a hard domain to picture um because it's very like lovecraftian and um kind of otherworldly yeah. uh then john wrote kind of a more uh psychological and uh, honestly a little humorous um yes uh bonus encounter that takes place in cartacas which is like this domain where full of like theater people and singers and performers all trying to best each other um and uh then there's a a, a dungeon crawl for the last one which is uh the the tomb of Tosk Tali, yeah. um, and that's in Harak here. And I, I like we we talked about this earlier, but yeah, this one I, I really enjoyed. And again, so much detail in the map. I mean, there's there's you can't you won't be able to see it on this camera, but the floor has uh, like hieroglyph puzzles, and it, it's, it's like a swirly marble effect on on that. It's just brilliant. Yeah, and and, and you know the floor like that is very it's uh, it's very intentional. There's um, 
for that that area there um, that, that ties into something with the dungeon and one of the art pieces that you'll see mm -hmm. um, rotate along in the stream. You're talking about uh, T2. Yeah, that is yeah. the uh, that one. something corridor, but yeah. Cool. So that's a that's the one you're gonna want to be careful in, uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we've we've woven together. I don't think outside of the images that you see and the screen caps, not screen caps, the the snippets of the maps from mm -hmm. the text, like the domain maps. Uh, it's 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 mostly our own commissioned art. I think there might be one raven in there, uh, uh, but yeah, just uh, Yusuf uh, Gorbani. Um, laid this out for us. Uh, he's done a lot of layout for us at this point. Um, he's a great designer uh, on the West Coast. And yeah, it's it's just cool to see something like this. I know we had talked a little bit about it, but our, our bonus encounters before were no more than a single uh, folded uh, sheet. So they couldn't really go past three pages. Mm -hmm. And so to, to do a saddle stitch book that's that's going on third, 30 pages uh, is pretty special for us. I, I again I, I mentioned it earlier where over the course of various boxes and, and BNG releases you know you've gone from one page to a, a fold out now to have an original collected piece is lovely and I really want to see you guys do more um, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know I know you've written some stuff as well I picked up uh, the fall of Alterel we did that oh, awesome. on, on our live stream as well it's um, that's a lovely introduction to Avernus in fact it's probably better than the opening to Avernus, I've used that. I've used your story to, to do that. Uh, yeah, Mike Shea, uh, better known as Live Flourish. Uh, I wrote that with Anthony, uh, yeah. Anthony Joyce. He's like my partner in crime and TTRPG writing. But uh, Mike said that 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 intro made his wife cry and he had never seen that kind of reaction before which which was for us we're like yes awesome like emotional response and he he loved it too it's just very very cool seeing that so anytime i get to write something um, that's always really enjoyable for me it, it, it was lovely i mean so we're, we're gonna keep going into into the box um i yeah, already right. attempted to open so uh please ignore the, the hole and you know because i was curious i wanted to, to see and i wasn't <laughs> sure what this piece was but it all kind of makes sense i mean that is beautiful that is heavy as well that is quite thick and that is beautiful yeah so that That's is our really plan nice chat piece. Um, there is in the adventure in the book, there is a spirit board, very much like a, a Ouija board mm -hmm. um, that you'll see um, that much as you'd expect <laughs> when you place the planchette on it, sometimes you might feel that moving as something some other force is trying to tell you something with that. Um, but what's really cool is you can take, we, we did a big print out of that spirit board that you'll see later. Yeah. Uh, and you can take that uh, and use it in other games where you want to conduct seances and things like that. But um, yeah, you can. That is really nice. It would probably make a really cool fridge magnet <laughs> too. <laughs> if, you, if you have really small print uh, cards or something on your fridge, you can go over that. Um, I'll leave that on the side. That is beautiful. I mean, that's a really nice yeah. piece. You've done medallions and pins and, and bits and pieces. And I think uh, you've also got a ring, which is, it's not the first time you've done a ring, but this is. Um, yeah, that would be our second ring ever. And I'll say too, another thing about the planchette is that's a yeah. different planchette than the one you'll see in the book. There is a small spirit board and a planchette there. And um, theirs is that classic kind of triangular shape. So you, I mean, we can look oh, at yeah, that yeah, later, yeah. but it's a, it's a little different. Um, we really went back and forth on that design a lot. Um, so this ring is the ring of Ossibus. Um, in, in the adventure text, uh, you will see that there is an amulet call out. Um, but we decided that, our, you know, with one other amulet already in this box and having recently done the holy symbol, that it would be cool to have kind of this signet ring for mm -hmm. the priests of Ossibus. Yeah, and that, um, this not... is kind of like, okay. yeah, it's, and it's nice. Uh, I mean, the, the other ring that we have is the uh, Lord's Alliance ring, which yeah. is a gold ring. So we really liked the idea of doing a kind of more worn silver one. Um, the priests of Ossibus are like a pseudo cult in Barovia um, that are called out in this book. They're not in Curse of Straw, but you could put them there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they worship like this, uh, I want to say this lich that was defeated 
uh, by Strahd. And so they shift their allegiance to Strahd, but they still wear Ossibus's symbol. And I, I love seeing all these things. I get a lot of stuff from uh, campaign coins as well. And it's yeah, literally yeah. Campaign coins are awesome. hand, handing these things out around a table. Obviously, the Avernus, you had the giant soul coin. Um, I, I love artifacts. I love, you know, yeah. I, I've been someone who's been playing D&D since I was 12. I've done, the, I've done the thing of making my own parchment, dipping it in tea, sticking it in the oven, burning the edges, mm-hmm. treasure maps, whatever you want to do. I, you know, people have done that. Yeah. Taking this to the next a, level. It takes of, a good, good yeah. while. And then creating these things which could be used on any artifact in any game. Just say, look, here's the ring. Here's the item you find. And handle it yeah. to the player. Is, it's just amazing. It's brilliant. Can, can I yeah, ask a question uh, on we, that? Oh, the Steve's in. Voice. Steve's in. <laughs> I, I crept Steve. in when you weren't looking. Oh, good afternoon. There he is. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, that's kind of now, unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah. So, Justice, have you seen um, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? I have not. Okay. I'm familiar with the concept. <laughs> there's a there's a pet monkey, and the only word you can say is Steve. Oh, that's so, awesome. That's, that's At least I'm not the pet monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Steve is my pet monkey. Um, I, I was going to ask a question. question about the ring. Actually, uh, is yeah, it, yeah. it is the surface raised? So, yes. if you felt inclined mm-hmm. to go and buy some sealing wax, yeah. you could start pressing out some of your own uh, scrolls. Yeah, that's actually a super cool idea, and I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, I bet you yeah. could. Yeah, because I, I like that. I like the when you sit in detail in the, on the picture. It's got that sort of uh, Ouroboros snake around the outside, but a skeleton, mm-hmm. which is way cool. Yeah, I, you know, and even um, I had made a, a little signet print for, um, or as a wax stamp back during my Curse of Strahd game, uh, or, or in anticipation of a, a Curse of Strahd mm-hmm. game that never happened, uh, per se, uh, <laughs> that um, for doing wax seals, because I love the idea of a villain talking with the characters i think that's a really special moments and so yeah and wax yeah. wax is just so cool in fantasy yes it is it is now this is something special this is amazing and it's heavy <laughs> big old yeah, chain yeah. um how did this come about because this is just epic yeah so there's there's a big theme running through this book uh, uh, raven loft of ravens um there are ravens all throughout the book um so we wanted a piece that was uh it could be more versatile um so i believe this piece is called uh i want to say it's called the mark of the raven uh pendant um so there's a lot of possible uses that you can have for this there's one called out in the adventure uh as a as a reward uh this amulet of the raven and it has certain uses um in there that i won't spoil in case anyone wants to run or as a player in those encounters um but there's a lot of other cool uses for it so there's there's a faction of uh were ravens in barovia um that are uh um that give you uh oh gosh well i can't remember what their names are uh well maybe somebody in the chat can help out um but there's these were ravens there, and in Curse of Strahd, they hand you some sort of uh, token of allegiance. Um, there's also uh, the Raven Queen resides in Ravenloft mm-hmm. and uh, is the patron for uh, any warlocks who choose the Hexblade domain. Uh, so w- we wanted something that felt very, you know, gothic, felt very Ravenloft that you could work into your campaigns. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's it's. It's pretty cool. It's um, it's a sizable piece. I mean, that's quite, that's meaty. I mean, that's got some. Yeah, it is it for well. sure. It's it's much bigger than the the photos lead you to believe as well. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. You yeah. see the pictures and you think it's going to be sort of this big, but yeah. it's not. Yeah, it's that is uh, and that is chunky. Yeah, things. and I mean, it's it's super cool. And the back is really nice too. So like, I mean, you could probably wear it either way. Um, I mean, you have your wizard symbol there uh, for for trademarking, but I, I love the texture of the feathers, um, and yeah. it is a really cool piece. Yeah. Um, I know people that do um, uh, like steampunk cosplays and things like that have talked about integrating this piece with uh, their aesthetic. I mean, it's the same with again, you know, um, is this a hand cholo 
Or is this someone else? Uh, yes, yeah. All of the physical um, artifacts for the these pieces are all by uh, Hanchella, I think. Amazing. Mm. Still amazing. Right. Yes, thank you, Dragon's Fire. Keepers of the Feather. That's Keepers what it is. Right, so we've got the we've got one of the scrolls open. Let's have a let's have a peek. So this looks like it's one of the one of the deeds it is. So this is property deed. Yeah. So that is a deed of property to um the Havelhrest Manor, mm -hmm. uh, the House of Lament, uh that's in the adventure. Um that is the house that the adventure takes place in. Um, so you get a cool property deed for that um, that you might be able to find if you're in the house. Mm -hmm. So again, um, with, with the, having it as a bit of twine um, and that, having it as a as a scroll, you introduced that in the Frost Maiden box. We hadn't seen. Yeah, that yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I want to say that was the first one that we did uh, in there, and those came in the map tube. Um, but uh, yeah, I love the idea of giving that to a player and then actually untying something and unfurling it like that. Yeah. Um, See, now you can use the wax seal. <laughs> and Stamp it. Yeah, yeah, you could. could you know, like uh, like in the Curse of Strahd box, you had the wine bottle stickers and things like that. Um, yeah, and you'll see some of those in the box as well um, for yeah. different wines. Because um, you had those, the uh, invite, invite your players to the game from an invite from Strahd. You could do the same. Yeah, so you just yeah. Literally a new, a new and, invite. To yeah, and, and you know, since these boxes are under the... Um, the, the wing of Hasbro, there are some things that we've wanted to put in boxes that like necessarily can't um, wax and fire <laughs> uh, yeah, are kind okay. of not <laughs> generally not approved. Any sort of candle or anything is very hard to get into the box. Um, but uh, we did include in that straw box, there are um, peel and stick uh, wax seals that you can add on yes, those, which is, that's which is right. pretty cool. Nice. And we put in some extras in case you wanted so you to do that. that. And this, box. again, you find a little note as well. And it's it's mm -hmm. pre-ripped on purpose. Yeah. It is, it is done. And, uh, you know, our, our uh, production goblins really enjoyed making these pieces because we can tell them, like, be rough with it. And, you know, yeah. they work. They have all kinds of other things they're making. And that's something they're usually not allowed to do with other customers. <laughs> We're like... Oh yeah, with salt marsh, we're like, can you get it wet? Can you yeah. waterlog the pieces? And they're like, uh, <laughs> Go to are you sure? I, I think salt marsh is still one of my favorite ones. It was, um, yeah. it's a silver edition, but the stuff on there, I again, it was it was Bill's piece. It was the the captain's log, and as you're reading <laughs> yeah. this piece, it is waterlogged. It is fairly damaged, and it's just talking a harrowing like captain's log experience. To literally yeah. the point of my men have gone to the island, they're not coming back. There are noises. Right, right. They're coming for us, and it was yeah, ooh, my, goosebumps. It was really yeah. Good. My my wife she runs a salt marsh themed campaign. She's been running for about a year um, now, and she uses that box for it. She's gone a little bit off the rails now, so I don't think she uses it as much as she did. But I yeah. know she's got the styes on her sites. Nice. Um, this so, is our artwork pulled from the book. Uh, this yeah. is a standard element that you'll see. Um, throughout our boxes um, these are designed so that you can hang them on your favorite dm screen yep um, in this silver edition there is not a dm screen included um, but we still wanted to offer this uh, same with the encounter cards that um, so that you can put them on your own um, i know a lot of people have a favorite dm screen some people have remarked like wow i love the art on your dm screen but i have a wooden one that i use more regularly yeah. um but uh, yeah, lots of really great pieces and something that always stands out to me and something that was very much true in this box and with Icewind Dale is the idea that like the artwork really sells the text in mm -hmm. a lot of these instances. Anytime you're working with horror, um, it is hard to, to, to get the, the tone across without seeing pieces like that. Like, you know, the, these hex bloods uh, over a fire chatting is so much more um, interesting to look at than, than just thinking about it. You see like even their different skin colors on there is just so cool. And the, yeah, that magic shop piece is just yeah. so this, iconic. This one is beautiful. They've got the shadows going across as well. And yeah, and you... I think during the promo materials, Wizards animated that a little bit, which was pretty cool. Oh, I didn't see that. I uh, didn't notice that one at all. And, uh, and on the inside of every single one, you mentioned uh, you've got the title, you've got the artist, but also the location. 
So mm -hmm. if you're yeah. playing from the book, you can say, okay, now is when you put this piece of artwork in front of your players. Um, and it's really nice to see. Yeah, I'm finishing up Avernus now. And usually what I do in the weeks uh, before, you know, right before the session, I'll look through and I'll grab whichever ones are in that chapter. Um, and then any villains and enemies that I might need. Um, do you have a particular uh, yeah, favorite lots piece of cool. in here? Do I have a favorite piece? Um, well, we actually did printouts of the artwork that we commissioned for our bonus encounters. And I would say that those are probably my favorite. You know, it's not often that we get to write an art order um, mm -hmm. to make a new piece. Uh, sometimes we're doing that just for things that help an adventure. Um, I think we did one for, I want to say for Eberron, we did a, a couple pieces of artwork that were mentioned in the text, but not explicitly shown. And they were really helpful to see and show your players. Um, but for this, you know, we got to each commission at least one piece for our bonus encounters. Um, so that, that piece by Claudio, Ooh. I know that uh, he did a few others. Um, and we did actually commission two, two pieces of artwork for a puzzle in um, the House of Lament that I think really sell things. Now, this is actually really interesting, that carnival piece. Mm -hmm. um, there, they actually alluded to Witchlight in yeah. this book in that the carnival's owners um, have swapped places. The two owners of the Witchlight Carnival, I believe, used to be the owner of this carnival in Ravenloft and oh, vice versa. Okay. So that's why there is a fey owner of the uh, carnival in Ravenloft, nice which is pretty cool. Uh, we've actually had a question from chat about the artists, um, and it's how do you go through the process of picking the artists for the different campaign boxes? Um, do you use, tend to use the same artists, or do you go in a different direction for each one? Yeah, and there's Isolde, Isolde that Faye. You can see her ears yeah. uh, are way up there. Very cool. Love that sword. Um, so, yeah, so that's a good question. For artists, typically, um, we work usually with established artists who have who have done artwork for wizards before because all of our pieces are subject to a very similar approval process that theirs is we have to submit sketches to them for concept um any time you see a a, uh, a creature that's from the D &D, mm -hmm. it needs to be in the versions and a feature there we've had pieces um that we've had to work on twice uh, or three times because it needs to be uh in accordance with their internal uh standards for those sort of things um even in the uh, bug i forget was a little different than the final bug bear in this box um <clears throat> But uh, yeah, so that's, we usually go through that roster. We pick artists that we like, we see if they're available um, and uh, usually reach out to them. Uh, typically, I think an artist has a little bit more time when they're working on the books than they do in our boxes because we're working with a shorter window. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, so when, when for this book, for example, how early do you see um, the Wizards book before you, you get a chance to start? Is it almost at the point of being published? Yeah, it varies. It varies between um, product to product. Uh, we get them a little bit earlier now than we used to. Um, there, you know, now that we've been working for them a while, we have, you know, established these relationships and, and, and they know how we work. Um, so they get it to us pretty soon. Um, there are there are point usually when we see the text, it's just the text. Um, and so later when we get to start seeing art previews and stuff, that really starts to help us, uh, you know, frame how we want. Especially if there's artwork of a of a piece that we might want to make a physical artifact of. Um, the exact lead time does it it varies. Um, but uh, oh, look at that. That, is... that, that reminds me of um, oh, what's what's the Netflix show? That is gross. Oh, I love it. That is wow. That's Vaughn something. Vaughn. Von Ulbrecher. Von Ulbrecher. The yeah, I think that's on the uh, the very Frankenstein esque place. I think it's Mordant or Morden something. 
The artwork, again, there is so much in here. Um, it is just, I mean, wow. Yeah. The artwork is stunning, as always. But hey. And there's lots of, you know, and there's something interesting that I, that I like that they did in this. And this is very much like these domains are set up so that you go into them. And yeah, mm -hmm. you can, you know, Wes Schneider, who was the lead on this book, has talked about this a little bit. Yes, you can go into Barovia and just do a side quest and romp around. You could go to Harakir and never meet, you know, this great pharaoh. But they're really set up so that inevitably you clash with the Dark Lord in some form or fashion. And so one of the things that they did that we ended up fretting about at one point in our in our uh, citing the box elements was, are we going to do encounter cards for each of the Dark Lords? Mm -hmm. um, but if you look in the sections, they never mention a Dark Lord's stats exactly. They say their stats are similar to another creature. And the way that they do that is because they've made it somewhat open into when you could challenge. Uh, and now these are the pieces that we commissioned for yeah. um, as a part of the puzzle for one of the... Um, this is for your Dread Tyrell. Encounter cards, uh, or one of the bonus encounters that Charlie did. Um, but yeah, they're set up much so that you can do this this storyline. This if you go to Barovia, you're going to clash with Strahd, and you learn about Strahd. Um, but because the stats say, oh, it uses the stats that are similar to an Elder Brain or similar to a Spy or something like that, it's so that you could probably approach that from any level. Um, you can be similar to a Spy and have a twentieth CR Spy. Um, though, if you're doing a psychological horror, you're probably not going to be epic level characters at that point. But uh, um, and that was pretty cool. We ended up not opting to do the Dark Lords because not all of them had artwork um, as well. Um, but for the ones that did, you'll see that there's artwork of them pulled from that book and presented for you to use. And everything, ooh, everything is nicely packed as well into every box. Um, literally, I've just opened that. It's just gone. <laughs> it's expanded. Um, so we've got a certificate of death. Yeah, you, you do do a good job of getting the stuff in in the box. Much much better than I do when I'm trying to put it back in the box after. Used the <laughs> yeah, yeah, and with the silvers, like, are definitely are. It's like, how do we fit all of this? You know, with the platinum, if you'll if you saw the Icewind Dale box, we have the foam now, which uh, really helps knowing where do each of these pieces go. How do I, you know, and if you go even far back, as water deep. There were even like little shelves at one point. Uh -huh. With the silvers, we want it all in one container. Um, it's important for us to to have that one package, and and, and helps us as well. Um, now that convention season is is uh, resurrecting uh, itself, that we can um, mm -hmm. bring a perfectly you know completely sealed box and say, hey, do you want to buy this box? And we actually have it instead of you know here's a pre order for something else, which we'll still do. Well, but, uh, it's I, nice to have a physical box. I'm hoping if you ever do come to the UK, um, let us know and we will meet you somewhere. Um, we are, we've been talking, because obviously with us doing Band of Badgers and we're talking to people in the States, in Australia and all around the world, uh, we have, um, th there's a chance we might actually come to Gen Con 2022. So, uh, okay. so who knows? Oh yeah, we'll be there. <laughs> who knows? This is one of the unique pieces as well for, um, for your Dread Tales. Yeah, that's used in Bill's bonus encounter. Uh, it is a supply ledger, and if yes. you pay, if you look at it very carefully, there's some cool stuff in the adventure that uh, might help you. Um, and that's also good because, as a defense um, bonus encounter, to know like what supplies you have access to that you could potentially use um, yep. to build structures or reinforce something, um, which it's, is a cool, it's a handy piece. It's quite a thick paper. Um, and it's it's, it's yeah. pre-weathered as well, one of those things which I I, I really really like. Mm -hmm. and, and that is one of the things as well is that you do get that variety that the you know, the handouts are not all printed on the same grade of paper, the same style of paper. Yeah. It is it, there is a variety, so you can tell the difference between the intention of each piece. Yeah, and that and that's both an exciting and a challenging part for us is is we'll have to think like. What does a death certificate look like? What handwriting <laughs> would be on it? Yeah. Who would authorize it? You know, when in the text, it just says, hey, there's a death certificate for this person. It might even go so far as to say the cause of death or something. Uh, in this case, it says 
a brief quote, um, less than a sentence, that you'll see appear on the death certificate. Um, but, but yeah, we have to come up with all the other content. And so we have to think, okay, where, which domain does this take place in? Who's the owner of that domain? Um, what would they think about this? Like, what are their terms? And so you'll see there's some cool, like, lore in there of like, who does this property actually belong to and what, mm -hmm. and who can seize it if they need to, um, that sort of thing, which is kind of cool. They're, they're lovely documents, actually. Again, you can just keep yeah. reusing these. Yeah. And they will, they will Yeah, work. they're nice. Um, so yeah, and these are our wine labels. Um, we give you, I think you, there's three, I want to say, is there, yep, you got three okay. of each, three of each. Um, one is a, uh, a, a weathered version of a previous wine label, because in the adventure you actually find, you can find a purple grape mash number three, Curse of Strahd fans will know, yeah. um, that is one of the three wines made in Barovia, which is pretty cool. Um, and hints towards, uh, uh, Wes has talked about this before, the idea that some of these that, that some of these domains seem like they share a border sometimes, or maybe at one point they were the same place. Um, I know that Jeremy Crawford's home game takes place in the realm that Barovia was in back mm -hmm. in like 1980 something before it left. So um, which is pretty cool. So like in his world, like Strahd conquered and stuff like that, which is cool. And then there's this Ludendorff arsenic wine, um, which is a new one for this, um, which is that's, not that's a wine that I would try. I don't know yeah, if I'd drink arsenic. something that had arsenic <laughs> written on the front, um, but somebody in uh, Ravenloft probably would. <laughs> and we've got some gorgeous looking maps. I just saw these. These are slightly different. So we haven't yep. seen so these, these are... before. Yeah, so this was different. This was something that I was um, I wanted us to do, which is uh, some of these one third page pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of them in this book, um, and it didn't feel right to shrink them down with there being so many of them. So we actually folded the paper hot dog style for these, yeah. and uh, they're a little bit harder to hang on your DM screen because we would have to have a very long and specifically cut piece of paper to hang it to show. Um, but you can actually prop them up because of their, uh, the rigidity of the paper and stuff. Um, some of them are, that's one for Blutspur by Mark Bem, one of my favorite fantasy artists. I actually have a, uh, oh, you put it out. right there. Wow. Um, that is really nice. Oh, he's, I just done, he's done a lot there. of work for wizards. Mm, yeah, yeah. Those are nasty. There, yeah. If you're if you've ever watched Invincible, they remind me of the uh, creatures that are on Mars, in there. Oh yeah, the little um, Just little yeah, brain, brain thingies. Brain things. Yeah, I mean, I've been in, I've been enjoying Invincible actually. Um, oh I, yeah, it's awesome. I, I, I wanted to ask you questions about your own writing, um, but we're going through the box so quickly. Is sure. that a, is that a white purple worm? Yeah, yeah, I believe that. I want to say that's in Aslan. At first, it looks like it'd be in Harakir, um, but it, I think yeah. it's I think it's like a a guardian uh, purple worm in in Haslan. Uh, wow. I think so. And I, if I remember correctly, that's actually a domain that does not have a dark lord, or the dark lord died. Oh, yeah, uh, but it is cool. cool. I love the idea one. of a different yeah. color of a of something that canonically is one color. So <laughs> a purple yeah. worm, a white worm. You could probably right reenact your favorite uh, so I, Captain I Ahab to, moments. You, you're, you know, you're doing a lot of writing. Uh, are you able to to tease anything you're, you're writing on next? Uh, yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, okay. These days, I'm working on a lot of stuff that's kind of uh, hush hush. Yeah. Um, I have something that I've wanted to do for the DM Guild for a while that just keeps getting pushed off because of other products, um, um, other projects. But uh, there's um, a potion supplement for expired potions that I thought would be fun that I've mm -hmm. already play tested and just need to get into layout basically. Um, but I, I mean, I did have something just come out not long ago uh, for MCDM's Kingdom and Warfare uh, book. Uh, I was one of the designers on that. So for that, I got to design a CR29 time dragon uh that <laughs> eats worlds and uh all kinds of cool stuff some magic items i did a chess themed quiver that the each of the arrows has a different chess piece head and has two different effects so the the uh the rook can make a tower in warfare um 
And then all of the other abilities, they're in some way connected to the way that the chess moves, the chess piece moves, um, which you, was a lot of fun. Are you seeing a lot more? Are you, are you seeing a bit of a swing towards uh, it, sort of the elite tiers, the tier four, 20th level characters and, and beyond that even? Do you think that's somewhere where wizards might take 5e? So for wizards, you know, that's interesting that you ask that. This question comes up from time to time. I see it on 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 Twitter a lot. Um, I think that Ray Winninger, the current uh, head over at Wizards, uh, I think for the creative team is, has mentioned that, that Wizards will continue to support tier four at, at the rate it's currently been supporting it, which is a, which is a nice way of saying nothing super specific about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, I mean, they have a tier four adventure um, in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Um, but uh, tier four is one of those areas, especially writing for tier four uh, is so um, swingy uh, because you have yeah. to account. There's, there's a balance between not counteracting what the characters do, but also challenging them. Because yeah. if you write a tier four and you don't account for teleportation, it might end very quickly. Uh, you know, if you don't have some sort of ward or some sort of hiding something, you know, when players can scry very easily, they can just find the bad guy. They can, you know, learn their plans through legend lore spells and things like that. So, um, so I I think that they'll probably continue to to occupy the same sort of level range that they that they have. Um, but I mean, I love tier four adventures, um, and I'd like to see them. So, um, I, I I imagine that we'll probably get more uh content in like the tier three range too um after which Light, but which Light's only one to eight i think so i i would be surprised if after that product that we didn't see something that went beyond eight and when when you're writing which tier do you find it most difficult to write for tier four <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's tier four tier four can be really exciting um but it, it's definitely the most difficult there's you get you have the most tools at your disposal because you can use the big creatures that you see, um, but also, you know, even the most powerful creatures in D and D, like as far as CR, can be super trivial for some parties. But a non-optimized party is going to have a really hard time. Um, you know, if I throw, we there are paladin. You, you frequently see comments of like, "Oh, my paladin did 150 damage in one turn." It's like, "Oh wow, I got to be ready for that as a designer." But the same party that doesn't have a paladin, you know, their wizard might get KO'd in the first round and then they're in trouble. Um, so tier four, I, I, my second hardest, I'd say, honestly, would be tier one is easy, but also hard because you're trying to be creative with such, mm -hmm. you know, with with the characters can't do a whole lot and the monsters aren't very, uh, very there's not very many of them. That, very fragile. Uh, but um, yeah, what, yeah. The, the thing that Steve picked up on, um, we've seen that in D and D Fourth Edition, where they went on to, you know, extended epic, went up to thirtieth level. Um, at that point, you're fighting gods. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it is. It is pretty. It'd be nice to see some content like that. Um, as long as yeah. yeah, I think just as a extra bit of variety. I was going to yeah, pick, and it. I mean it's. It's hard and it's hard to set up to like, I mean, we just, we just in our session last week um, had a very high level bad guy appear that, that I'll probably be writing a post campaign for that mm -hmm. happens after Avernus, but that's all very specific to my group. And I, it would be a very different looking adventure if I was writing it for every audience. Yeah. Yeah. There's something that uh, Bill and Grimm have done in previous boxes is the pre-gen characters, which I like. One of the things yeah, yeah. I've really enjoyed seeing is the kind of the quotes. So straight away, yeah. someone who's not familiar with role playing, they can take these quotes and can just kind of uh, get an idea of what the character is. But there's some really nice things. You've got the Dampier Rogue, a reborn barbarian, the Hex, Hexblood Druid. Really nice bits and pieces in here. A lot the of quotes variety. are a lot of fun. The quotes in the intro text are the are where we get the most variety. Yeah. Um, so Jason Vickery, uh, he does our social yeah. media. He wrote a few of these, and then I wrote the others. Um, so the, the the rogue and the 
I'm gonna say he did the rogue, the warlock, and I would say he did the rogue and the warlock. He might have done one other. There's there's definitely a Frankenstein parody in there, and it's yeah. that it's that reborn. His name is Franklin Grave Caller. <laughs> um, and the that character concept's kind of cool because he like his bond is the flesh that the the other people that make him up he can still feel their desires and stuff so he wants to like write out what they did left undone in life yeah, so it, the idea that like it says yeah, yeah that the, character might hear whispers of their from their arm uh that belong to somebody else that maybe has <laughs> an unresolved romantic interest that they need to go and apologize to or something. Uh, and this new person is compelled to do that. I thought it was a really cool character concept. There's some, there's some nice stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I wonder if that was a tie in to, uh, to Charlie's adventure as well. Yeah. There, and the and we tank. definitely tied a lot of these in. Yeah. There's one of them that's from Har that has like a relationship to Harakir. Yeah. Uh, that we always try to tie them heavily to, the adventure of the box uh and you there's there's lots of nice fun easter eggs there and i'd say that these were probably the hardest i mean the pcs aren't necessarily super challenging to write but mm -hmm. but these were probably the most challenging because of the new lineage rules uh at the time and uh they just get so many abilities uh, it felt like and so <laughs> you always see us go onto the back of the page and all of these too <laughs> I like some of these as well. So these are the, again, this is your content, original content. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Bill's story, uh, the granary from Dread mm -hmm. Tales. And it's yeah, just a mini a crevasse a mini, underneath. Yeah, it's just a mini battle map. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. And I, I want to say it's to scale as well. I think you can actually put miniatures on that yeah, one. Yeah, that one is. Uh, this is Charlie's one. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're going to be playing this and Steve's going to be one of the players. I don't want to give him too many spoilers, but yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's uh, mind fluid. Um, yeah, so yeah, some really nice stuff. There's uh, oh, there's no way I'm gonna fit this under the camera, but these maps, the artwork I mentioned in earlier, they are gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, so this is I really liked this. This adventure has kind of like a mini gimmick in it, in that the house has certain rooms that are different when they're dormant. So the house kind of wakes up, uh, as haunted houses often do. Um, mansions tend to have secrets lying in them. So we actually did two maps of all of the floors with one exception, yeah. um, which was kind of cool. Uh, and, and that was one of my ideas that I pitched, and they really liked it. And it was cool to be able to have this. So when you're GMing this and you get to a point where this house is going to wake up, you flip the map over mm -hmm. or in one of the maps cases, you reveal the other half. Um, and it has, has a very different charm to it. There's ghosts moving around. There's uh, some of the things that were more wrote look a little bit more corrupted. Um, there's hands reaching out for things, toys coming to life, that sort of thing. So it's, it was really cool for our artist, uh, for uh, I think this is Jared Blando um, who did these maps uh, for for Jared to be able to kind of take the bones of one map mm -hmm. and then use them. Uh, I mean, there's even like a grass effect on the outside of the building. You've yeah, got yeah. Smoke and mist and fog and, and there's actual grass, blades of grass. There's, I don't think the camera's gonna. Oh yeah, they might do. It does. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is incredible. And we went a little different than our canvas paper in this one, um, just because a, a main reason is that these maps are dark. They're very dark maps. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's horror themed. And so being able to, to show that color and have it come across to all the players looking at it, we needed a little bit of a different material for this one. It's still it's still a nice high end paper. It's just not that I was just trying you to don't get up. that feel that you have on the other trying to pick up those footprints there. There's some ghostly footprints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little clues. There's a really, really. Yeah, nice and there are times that I'll lay a, a BNG map down that's there's not one in the text. Um, like I said, going through Avernus, Avernus has black and white map, or I guess red and yeah. white maps. I think Dice and Logos did them. And so when Jared or Jack or somebody does a map for that, oftentimes I lay out the map and I start talking, 
and my players lean in and they start looking at the details and they're like, oh my gosh, look at that. Or there's that thing that he just said, or this, or this, and this. And I have to stop for a moment and just let them take it all in, which is a lot of fun. Do you, so when you play your, your, your table games, do you use, um, fog of war or do you just lay out the whole map? And then, you know, they know where the bedroom is. They know where the kitchen is, but they don't know what's going to happen when they enter those rooms. Yeah, it depends. You know, uh, I think for this map, I might actually do a fog of war and cover up pieces of it. Mm -hmm. But for some other maps, like the flying fortress in Avernus, a lot of the times I kind of, I'm fine to just lay out the map. I'll give players a player version over uh, Discord because I think... Unless there's something really spoilery about the map, I might give them half of it or something. Um, I think actually seeing the scope of a map also helps them kind of to plan their abilities. There's a big dungeon in the opening of Descent into Avernus Mm -hmm. that is very deadly. It's actually the second dungeon my players have ever... It's it's the only dungeon my players have ever fled and come back to later. (laughs) uh, Because they got so resource drained that they were like, we need to leave. Uh, was that, was that and the so they left and came back in. Was that the sewers? What was, that? was that the sewers in Boulder's Gate? It was. It's the Dungeon of the Dead Three. Yes. yes. Um, so very. Uh, I I wanted. To I, come... I have heard others have similar uh, experiences in that deadly dungeon. I wanted to go back over something you said about uh, when you pitch your idea. Is that to the team or is that to mm-hmm. Wizard of, Wizard of the Coast? Uh, it's to the team, and then they pitch to Wizards. You know, Wizards, obviously, they approve everything that we put in here. They weigh on content. Yeah. Um, there are some things that we can't do for um, licensee reasons or um, some sort of possibly tying into another product or yeah. something like that. Um, but we have these gr- meetings that um, Bill or any of the overlords will talk about that are very special, that it's it's kind of this open, unstructured time where we... We have just read the text. We have all thought about things and we just go through it either chapter by chapter or throwing out big themes of it. Like somebody, whoever's leading the box leads that meeting. Mm -hmm. So for Ravenloft um, and Icewind Dale, like we would sit down and Paul or Matt would say like, hey, what did you think about chapter one? Like, what do you think that we could do for the player options? Sometimes it's a very quick in in a section like, oh, well, we're going to do player characters using these new player options everybody agrees we nod they're like that's good then other times it might get more contentious because matt will say we need a plushie here and some of the uh, overlords (laughs) have very strong thoughts on plushies Plushies. um and sometimes it's a matter of like oh let's look into that that might be really difficult for us to do because it either doesn't fit or it's too expensive or it would cost us something else going in the box where do you Um, sit on the plushies I like the plushies. It depends. I, plushies. I think the plushies are really great when they tie into the story. Yeah. Um, so you saw that we have a Sir Talavar plushie for yes. Witchlight coming up. Sir Talavar is a character in the adventure and it's a fairy dragon. So it's kind of to scale. And in a way, it's kind of like Lulu in that. So I'm, I'm definitely for it. I wanted to bring, bring this one out under the camera because this is ties in. Uh, this is the spirit board. Yep, that's the spirit board. And wow, it is that, big. Yeah, yeah. And so that has its own dedicated page so you can lay that out and, and have it ready and on top of a map. And then you have your planchette and you can move your planchette over there and it will magnify those numbers uh, and letters and all the things on there. Um, but it's kind of fun. We actually have a really big gaming table, which is kind of funny because I bet if we did a spirit board, not all of us would be able to reach the center. Uh, so yeah, it I'm going to have to think about that. It, it does actually magnify them. Yeah. 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 And I think that that classic kind of when you're moving <laughs> over other letters, it's like a very iconic Ouija type moment. Yeah. It's really nicely done as well. It's a lovely piece of artwork. Yeah. It's and now uh, this one does appear simple. in the book, but we've we blown it up. If you look at the text, um, I think yeah. it's down to an eight and a half by 11 page uh, yeah. just because that's how big the book is. Um, but we, you know, got permission to blow it up to this. We thought about uh, putting it on like a, a like a, a big board or something, but getting it to fit in the box and still be that sturdy material would be uh, pretty, is pretty difficult. And now, as always, we have the Beetling Grim encounter cards. 
Um, and yes. this is something new as well. We have a, a list, which is which is really nice, and we have the list on the in the introduction. Yeah. And the entire lots of, and lots of good encounter cards in this one. Uh, some pretty interesting monsters. And the entire collection, the entire book, is separated, which is another thing mm -hmm. I really enjoyed about this because this harks back to, again, I'm one of these a D and D lifer when I remember buying these, and that's all you had was the floppy. Um, yeah, and that first one is really special, um, just because I I really like when wizards puts a lot of that player facing material in an mm -hmm. earlier chapter, because then when we decide to break it up like this, yeah. that book becomes very useful. In Waterdeep, it was the Waterdeep and Chiridian that was really special, um, and in this book, yeah, you have like these first sizable number of pages in here, like. They give you an introduction to the world. You have player characters, yeah. ancestries, that sort of thing. So um, being able to hand that to a player and say, here you go, like, take a look at this while I'm preparing for a session. Like, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, for when your players turn up early as well at your gaming table. Yes. It, it is nice. It is really one of, nice. yeah, one of my players usually, uh, <laughs> usually is pretty early. <laughs> but we yeah. always have a 30 minute fluctuation, and, you know. And they're like, is it six thirty or seven at night? I'm like, six. Let's do seven. I've got some stuff to do. And then one of them doesn't get the message, and that person shows up at six thirty. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> sit over there. I'm going to be quiet for the next thirty minutes. <laughs> I'm just doing the last minute prep. I, I did have another question from chat from earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, um, what do you find is your best writing environment or atmosphere? Um, I write here in my office usually. Um, sometimes I write at a coffee shop. I will uh, upload things to Google Drive I, and um, pop them out there and, and, and work. I'd say I do well with a cup of coffee, some music, and some ambience. I can't really listen to, which is the bane of my existence in tabletop because there are all these awesome actual plays. I can't listen to an actual play while I write because I get distracted by the dialogue um i'll find myself writing what they say or something so um <laughs> just just somewhere that i can kind of pull away that there's some white noise some uh and just a good bit of focus but i'm always generating ideas as i'm on the go i keep a little booklet with me pretty much everywhere and anytime inspiration strikes i write it down in an mm -hmm. attempt to give me things later uh to write i've just found the photo the map folio in the bottom of the box as well this is another nice touch all the yeah the maps yeah. that you need for all the worlds you can visit just reprinted on nice cardstock full color handouts yeah it's really some nice. there are some really cool uh map styles in there i think it's uh i think her name is francesca ballard did that blue map that, that you one. see there yeah. the those I really love uh, her style of, of maps. Um, it's really nice. Yeah. For Lamordia, I think she did Borka as well. Um, but there's something about her cartography that I just really uh, enjoy. Yeah, it's nice as well uh, that they, they get reused because some of these are uh, fourth edition. Um, I don't think they're third edition, but some of them are fourth edition. Which is really, oh, are they? Really nice. I, I've, these, these are all the ones that were in... Um, chapter three of the book so that's kind of interesting i bet i bet that's a, a cartographer from fourth edition yeah i mean uh, of got, course you have mike, mike schley there as well yeah uh, very easy to recognize mike's style yeah um, and that's the one for harakir which i think is really cool because there are not a lot of desert maps in mm -hmm. 5e uh, it's not a biome that they've frequented no no it, that's that's nice as well just to have that folio that's another nice touch. Again, hand. Sorry, what's what's on the? Was there something on the back? On the on the oh, map. The, the cards, yeah, yeah. You've got. Oh uh, yeah, each of the there we chose one of the marks of horror that goes with it, and then you can also take area notes on the back of it, which is kind oh, of that's, fun. That's cool. Um, some of them have more than one mark of horror associated with them, so we did our best to just pick the one that felt the most characteristic for that place. Yeah. Yeah, really nice. How about that? Really nice touch. I, I, again, it's all the, it's the, it's, you know, everything you make as Beetle and Grimm's is to make the game more immersive, tools for the DM, and even, you know, just even things like collecting the maps, having them in a folio. Um, I, I love it. Um, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time there, folks. We've gone over by half an hour as well. I won't go through the encounter cards if you've seen these before. They are utterly gorgeous. I'll quickly, just in case you haven't seen one. 
Um, they are yeah, and for these encounter cards, gorgeous. we have some that are um, unique as well for the uh, bonus encounters in there. So you'll see some strange creatures in there that maybe don't feel like they belong in uh, Ravenloft, uh, like an Era Elemental, but that's in one of the adventures. Spoiler alert. Yeah, this um, is Bright Eyes, which is mm -hmm. uh, from the Granary. There's, is that, a, are they gonna tell you what, uh, Lucindy, okay, they give you a little clue. <laughs> yeah, that's in John's. That um, and then the others are from the tag. So oh, yeah, yeah, the the were raven, very cool. Yeah, yeah. With the symbol. The really hybrid. Really I nice. think that's a hybrid form were raven. And then we included some other familiar monsters. That, yep. So any any encounter card uh, from the book is the one that had artwork with it. Um, it's hard for us to show. You know, we don't want to give you an encounter card that doesn't have. Ooh, purple worm, faster, faster. Um, <laughs> We don't want to give you an encounter card that, and that's actually for a purple worm lean, uh, which is yeah. kind of interesting. We don't give you, we don't want to give you one that's not the creature on it. Um, we want you to be able to say this is what you see. Um, but uh, there's lots of really awesome creatures in the back, and then we included kind of some more fitting monsters that were mentioned in some of the different domains. So you're gonna want a zombie. You're gonna want as you know a werewolf ghost uh there's the Lugaru. i think that's like a canadian lore uh werewolf which is the i love that werewolf yeah that's really nice so, so get, get now where the like entropy is what were you gonna say steve oh, so i was just gonna say going back to the gallows speaker there's there's some of these you look at and the art is so nice you're gonna want a mini for it so, right yeah, yeah I, i'm not sure if you can get a gallows speaker mini but i'm gonna go and look after we finish <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think some of these show up, maybe I want to say in the Reaper, on the Boneyard minis mm -hmm. that they, not Reaper, uh, Whiskey's Boneyard minis that they did, which is pretty cool. Um, brain yeah, I love the brain in the tank. <laughs> so cool. Oh, no, that is gross. Boneless, yeah, they can slip under doors. Isn't that nice? Oh, that Delicious, that one. Gross, yeah. You got your flesh go down. Headless Horseman? We've got the Death's Head. Death's Head, and I want to say the other is like a Dullahan, which I think is basically a Headless Horseman. So, well, but well, that well, one's not on there because there's another hmm. question from chat as well. Um, and although it's not a setting, uh, are you planning on doing anything from Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons? It's a good question. That's a very good question. I would say that. Uh, to yeah. sign up for our mailing list. Oh, oh, that, that wasn't a no. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a no. It wasn't a no. Not a no, not a yes, <laughs> no, no, but yeah, sign yeah. up for our mailing list. And yes, if yes. if we do, in fact, do any products for uh, announced or unannounced books, you'll see about it there as soon as we let you know. And then there is uh, a I think that's a very cool chat. book. I was a big fan of the Draconomicon. Uh, that, is, that is one of the only books that I bought after I started playing 5e from a prior edition. I, I love this artwork. For some reason, it reminds me of uh, Judge Death. I don't know why. Who? Ju Judge, uh, Judge, you know Judge Dredd? You know oh, Judge, Judge Dredd. Dredd, yeah, because yeah. it's got the face. And then, yeah. then you've got Judge Death and the Four Horsemen. So Judge, Judge cool. Dredd had to fight Judge Death. It was judges from another dimension, all, uh, you know, pestilence and everything else, um, who were named awesome. after the Four Horsemen. And they come to Dredd's, uh, Dredd's land. And they want to take over. He's like, no. It's obviously, that's awesome. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic story actually when that happens. Um, yes, uh, Maverick Two. It is. I believe that's Brandon. Uh, yes, just one mailing list for every product right now. Now we did have a separate one for the Kickstarter uh, last year, um, but uh, as of right now, it should just be the one. Oh wow. Look yeah, zombie that. clot, I believe that is. That's what happens when you don't want to run a bunch of individual mobs or zombies. You just throw them all together, and then you attack them with that huge monster. That is incredible. That would be a good mini. <laughs> that would be a good mini. I have not seen a mini of that one yet. Do you, do this you is, get to... this is an unspeakable horror, so that's just one form that could take. Ah, oh, and the classic shadow. Shadow. 
nothing like throwing a low CR monster that can <laughs> <laughs> kill your players at a very low level. I win this game. That one I see come up so much in discussions of CR being not perfectly balanced. So, um, you know, like you did um, with Frost Maiden, you specifically worked with WizKids on that kind of box set. And we know you're doing the same yep. with Witchlight as well. Do you get yeah, to yeah. pitch your original ideas as minis, or do they have to work with what Wizards of the Coast say? For for so for the minis, we choose from what they have available, okay. yeah. um, which is pretty cool. So um, and pretty much any any NPC, any important creature, those are things that uh, any new creatures, those are the things that show up pretty frequently. If WizKids has done a mini before, mm -hmm. uh, they they usually don't do it again unless it's a very specific rendition of it yeah um so i don't know that there are any i don't know that there are any new fairies in there they might have like a new pixie or something like that i, I have to look they announced their miniatures but i don't remember what that list consists of um but i think ours has i want to say 17 miniatures in our witch light box yeah um including like all of the hags which is cool who doesn't love a hag i love yeah, hags a full set well, there we go, everybody. Uh, that is, thank you again. Uh, I know Bill had to run off because everyone has to work. Uh, Bill has a day job as well. Um, but again, Justice, thank you much, much for, for your time. Uh, I know yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. And I know you haven't had your breakfast yet. So. <laughs> oh, I did actually have some coffee. My wife but, was very uh, nice and she brewed some coffee with some bottled water because her water main is down. Um, and uh, but, I am... Um, feeling refreshed the these are amazing and so for one more time we've got witch light platinum which light platinum and silver are available right now on our website yeah. um we also have a very cool promo t-shirt which has uh butterfly wings or fairy wings on it i want to say uh on the back which is nice and uh uh hey mcguire how you doing um and uh yeah those three boxes are available um we have announced a collaboration with uh critical role in mm -hmm. some way with their new taldori book um so stay tuned for more information on that yeah. um i would ask everybody to sign up for our mailing list because um that's going to be the best way to hear about what we're working on uh and there's still more cool stuff to come this year uh for sure definitely looking forward to it i mean I, i'm i'm really excited with all the new stuff you've got new opportunities coming up um the stuff you we're doing with peso we'll see um we'll see beetle and grim again in next month in august for us because um, mm -hmm. we're going to talk more about the the peso stuff the character chronicles um and uh yeah i hope this uh, this is a nice kind of new format for us uh doing our q and a's like this and just talking about them and just picking more about how you choose your artists, the people you work with, the creativity mm -hmm. behind everything you do um, is really, really interesting. I'd love to always yeah. know more. And for those of you who watch, uh, I was going to say Billy Graham, for those of you who watch Band of Badgers, we will be playing these as well sometime soon because over the summer we're doing some short stories. So uh, this fits, the, the Dread Tales fits perfectly in with that, yeah. uh, which is absolutely amazing. That is an epic box. I want to start playing it now. Um, I've got to take. I have to take some time to plan it. But um, I've been reading Dread Tales, but everything's in there. Again, the maps are gorgeous. Everything is reusable. The artifacts and the items. That's now mine. Um, I'm going to keep hold of those ones. Thank you very much, Steve. Any last questions or audience? Any last questions? Um, there was there was one that I missed. Uh, so I apologise for that. And it was. Um, what were what were your favourite domains or, or monsters that are in that box? What's your what's, I guess what's your favourite piece of art? What's your favourite piece in that box? Oh wow! Um, favourite domains. Yeah, that's that's tough. There's a lot of good ones. I mean, I think Blutspur is really interesting because I love mind flares. There's some. Um, I, I think that maybe my favorite monster in there might be the vampiric mind flare, which I believe drinks spinal fluid instead of blood, um, which is horrifying in its own right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, and, and that art was done by Mark, uh, Bem and I love Mark Bem. So anything that he does, I, I tend to enjoy. Um, 
But uh, as far as the domains, I, I, I really like Harkir. I like that it's different. Um, and uh, the designer who worked on it was very thoughtful about the way they went about it. And uh, some of their threads that they wrote influenced the way that I wrote um, that bonus encounter. And another cool thing about our bonus encounters that I forgot to mention are uh, there are content warnings on each of the bonus yes, encounters. So, so that yes, way yeah. you can uh, discuss those up front. Uh, there's a part in this book on consent and horror. And so if you have any players that, you know, are afraid of suffocation, you know, right off the bat that mm -hmm. the Harakir bonus encounter involves suffocation pretty uh, heavily in two parts. So you know about it and you can let them know and see if it's something they're interested in, if you're going to line it, veil it, that sort of thing. So that's kind of cool. Cool. That's cool. That is cool. Well, we hopefully we'll see you again soon. Justice, we want to try and get you onto a painting stream as well at some point. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Um, well, cool. Until that time, we will see you all again soon. Bye-bye.